Aloha. This is Dr. Sasha Lesson, and with me right now is... Janet Care Lesson. Yeah. This is some really, really interesting uh, stuff from ancient anthropology. Now that we know what we know about genetics, and we've been able to translate ancient writings uh, from Sumer, from way long ago, from uh, after 11,000 years ago even, and uh, this will absolutely change everything once we realize that these two great scientists... Zachariah Sitchin and uh, Michael Tellinger have put together the mysteries of how we got to be how we are and why we keep fighting each other and why we have diseases and stuff like that. And with this knowledge, we are going to be able to take care of things in a way better way than ever before. And so what this uh, um, whole branch of study is called revisionist anthropology, where we look at the so-called uh, myths of ancient civilizations, and instead of saying, well, yeah, these guys were smart, they built great big buildings and uh, had all this, uh, it could make bricks and do all kinds of great things like that, uh, but they just made up these stories about gods who told them how to do everything. They, they have primitive minds when it comes to gods. Well, what we, have, what we can now tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that these so-called gods were just big, tall people, I mean, 12 to 15 foot people, and they're depicted in, you know, on statues and drawings and everything, it's just exactly that, who have laser weapons, who have rocket ships, who have helicopters, and who controlled uh, the planet through a hybrid uh, race of slaves, that's us, that they manufactured. What I would like to do uh, right now is to just look at uh, the main things that they said, sort of an overview of um, uh, what they gave us and how they conditioned us to be in what's essentially the same matrix that they created right now, one of hierarchy, of uh, competition, of war, you know, the, the, uh, uh, that kind of uh, thing, that uh, degradation and derogation of women and minorities and a, a very small ruling elite and the whole thing, which we got from them. And so we will go back to what they had on, on their planet before they got here and uh, what they created here and what we can do to get out of it. Um, would you like to say anything to sort of uh, kick off the thing, Janet? Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to listen to our first broadcast of Enki Speaks. Our website is enkispeaks.com, www.enki, which is spelled E-N-K-I, and speaks, S-P-E-A-K-S, dot com. And uh, we're going to explore the writings of um, the ancient astronauts and what they left behind here on the Earth, the anomalies all over the planet, and their current interactions with humanity, and the messages they left us. And so we're starting by exploring, what is the book, first book we're starting with? Uh, well, go ahead. Basically, <clears throat> the thing, the book that brings a lot of this together is called The Lost Book of Enki, where the Atreus uh, and the Enuma Elish uh, are all brought together in a cogent whole basically from the writings that were dictated by one of the, the chief scientists of the gold mining expedition to Earth, whose name was Enki. But I, I, just, I, should give, I would like to just sort of give an overview of what we'll be getting into slowly in, uh, in, in uh, detail. I was, attracted, yeah, I was attracted to all this stuff because um, there were so many uh, unaccountable things in, in, in our history. Suddenly there were these jumps in civilization and there was a uh, movement of gigantic uh, stones that we can't even move today. Uh, all kinds of amazing stuff that uh, no one in the 1900s uh, kind of uh, anthropologist could make any sense of, but now we can make lots of sense of all this stuff. Okay, so we have this history that uh, the people of ancient Sumer wrote uh, with, on clay tablets, and we can now read what they wrote, uh, and they said, here's what the gods dictated, and, uh, and, and the story in a nutshell, we're going to look at this in great detail because it's very, very important to us, is that uh, their planet which was revolving around a, a dwarf, a, a dark star dwarf named Nemesis, intersected our uh, inner solar system. And uh, they were coming here to get gold because they were losing their atmosphere. And it was determined that if there was gold here, and we're going to really go into how they, all that came about, and they wanted to bring the gold back and refine it down to the white powder of monoatomic gold and put that, let that float all over their atmosphere and hold the atmosphere in. That's why they came here, and uh, they, uh, so the astronauts were digging in the African gold mines, and they revolted, and the chief scientist said, look, uh, I'll uh, graft some of our genes onto these local humans here, 
humans called Homo erectus, and we'll make these short-term slaves that'll be happy to work for us and, and they can do the mining. And then as the mining operations grew and, and the uh, expedition leaders settled down to have uh, thieves of their own, basically they used them for farming and then they started warring against each other and used them as uh, military. And when the humans started to realize there's only a few thousand of these um, and there's millions of uh, these hybrids, that's us, uh, they started uh, becoming alarmed. And, yeah, yeah, and so uh, what happened was they realized that in one of the passes of uh, their planet as it was going to come uh, between Mars and Jupiter. It was going to make the ice on the Antarctic slide into the South Sea and cause a great big deluge and just really t totally uh, mess up the Earth. And so um, the commander said, don't, he said to all of the Nibirans, don't tell the hybrids that uh, they're, they're an illegal race anyway. We're not, we're not supposed to create slave races according to the uh, laws of planetary colonization. So just let them all drown and I forbid anyone to tell them. Well, chief scientist, one of the guys that made the hybrids, uh, instead of telling them, he took the, the plans, the computer plans, and put it in Noah's wall. We, Noah's real name was the Asutra in the Sumerian stuff. Uh, how to make a submersible, and, and this guy, Enki, left his son, Nergal, to drive the uh, submersible to the top of um, Mount Ararat in, in Turkey. And uh, they, uh, the uh, Nibirans decided they would now rule through the descendants of Noah. and. Uh, it's the descendants of those descendants of those descendants that to this very day rule us and follow the same pattern of divide and conquer and uh, that's the, in a nutshell and what, it, uh, what they did. And they, their competition got so heavy that at one point uh, the commander actually nuked uh, his, his, his nephew's forces, but the fallout from the nuking uh, of Sinai and uh, the uh, cities on the south end of the Dead Sea. The fallout from that blew all over Sumer and killed everybody there. The only people to escape were the people that were too far north in Babylon. And so they, the head of the of Nibirin in Babylon, a guy named Marduk or Ra, took over for a while. And, and so it is. Most of these guys from Nibiru left uh, from uh, their last base up in Nazca on top of the Andes, up past Lake Titicaca, uh, and went back around 2024, 2025 uh, BC. And, uh, but some of them stayed around, particularly uh, the commander and Lil or Yahweh, and uh, he was. Uh, we will go into great detail of just uh, what he did in the uh, affairs of humans and, and that sort of thing. So, what would you like to say is by way of introduction, darling? Well, I thought we could begin by a reading from the Lost Book of Enki, yes. which is a lovely, lovely book written by Zechariah Sitchin. Uh, Zechariah Sitchin was a scholar, and he translated ancient Sumerian and other ancient texts which predate the biblical texts and are the foundations of our modern religions. Uh, the, the, um, you know, we'll go into that in, in, in greater depth in a later period. But um, Zechariah Sitchin left us uh, October, I think it was 9th or 10th of the year 2010. And so he left us a legacy of about 10 or 12 books based on all this research that he did starting in 1976 with The 12th Planet. So we're going to begin by reading from um, yes, I'll start the here. first tablet of the Lost Book of Enki. Okay. In prior times, none of the gods was on earth, nor were the earthlings, that's us, yet fashioned. The abode of the gods was on their own planet, Nibiru, a great planet, reddish in brilliance, around the sun, an elongated circuit Nibiru makes. For a time in the cold is Nibiru engulfed, for part of its circuits, by the sun strongly is it heat heated, and a thick atmosphere Nibiru envelops by volcanic eruptions fed. All manner of life this atmosphere sustains. In the cold period, the inner heat of Nibiru, it keeps about the planet like a warm coat that is constantly renewed. In the hot period, it shields Nibiru from the sun's scorching rays. It holds and releases to lakes and streams, giving rise. Our own species sprouted by our own essence and eternal seed to procreate, and our numbers grew. To many regions of Nibiru, our ancestors spread. Some tilled the land, some four-legged creatures shepherded. Rivalries occurred, encroachments happened, clashes occurred. Sticks became weapons, and clans gathered into tribes. Then two great nations faced each other, north against south. Missiles, weapons of thunder and brilliance, there was death and destruction, both north and south. For many circuits, desolation reigned the land. All life was diminished. Truce was, peacemaking was declared. Emissaries said to one another, let there be one throne on Nibiru, one king to reign over all. Leader from the north or from the south, by lot be chosen. If he be from north, let south choose a female to his spouse as equal queen to reign alongside. If by lot a, a south male be chosen, let the north's female be his spouse. Let their firstborn son be the successor in the unified dynasty, thus be formed. 
on the bureau forever to establish. Okay, let's um, let's go over that to what we just said, okay. and further explain because that's a lot of information. Okay. And it was written in what they call dynamic pentameter. It's a style that is very poetic in nature. So we're talking about um, life back on Nibiru, which is the planet where the Anunnaki come from. And Nibiru, could you explain, Dr. Wilson, about the elongated orbit? Of yes, Nibiru? okay. So Nibiru does not rotate around our sun. It never goes around our sun. It goes around a dark star that we can't see because it's dark but has its own uh, amount of uh, light. It's about 49 astronomical units from here. It's called Nemesis. And Nibiru comes through our inner solar system every 3,600 years. And uh, so that's uh, when these guys from this planet that's going around uh, Nemesis uh, can most easily uh, come here. And uh, so they uh, had trouble with this, with this. What we're saying here is that ordinarily Nibiru is protected by its atmosphere. And now uh, some, and they've got a unified uh, uh, planet. They fought a nuclear war where everybody was dying. There was way more women left than men. And they said, we've had enough. We'll just have a king. And what they established was a military dictatorship. Now, something we're going to read on, something is about to happen. Janet's going to read to you for a bit. Well, I wanted to go over this a little bit more before we go to the next phase. Good. So what he was saying in this book is that um, life began in, on Nibiru. And just like on Earth, um, they... It developed an atmosphere which shielded the Nibiru from the sun's scorching rays, and, and Nibiru is part of a twin star solar system system of um, Solaris, which is Earth's sun, and Nemesis, which is the sun of Nibiru. So those these two suns rotate around each other, and they all have they have planets and moons around each sun. So then they just like humanity, they started to grow in numbers, and they went to, to all regions of the of Nibiru of the planet. And some became farmers who tilled the land, and, and uh, some of them became shepherds of four-legged creatures. And some lived in the mountains and the valleys. But then rivalries occurred, and, and they got territorial, so encroachments happened, and they uh, clashed. And eventually, sticks turned into weapons, and tribes began, and, and two great nations, the north and the south, faced each other. So they're talking about their entire history, which probably spans uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of years. We don't know exactly. These are translations of ancient texts, cuneiforms, and so we're, we're deciphering this as we go along. But it, it, eventually they had, they developed, like humanity, missiles, and weapons of thunder and brilliance increased the terror. And so a long war, fierce, engulfed the planet, and brother amassed and fought against brother. And there was death and destruction, both north and south. And so for this, this happened for many circuits, meaning um, rotations around the planet, and so, and so desolate, desolation reigned the land and all life was diminished. So they, we see that the Nibirians uh, were bombing themselves to extinction, so we can learn from this. Then they did, declared a truce, and they started negotiations, peacemaking, and they, they declared, let the nations be united, the emissaries said to one another, and they decided to have one throne on Nibiru. So they had a kingship, and they were definitely... Um, crowning a king, but this is very critical. They had a, a leader from the north and the south, a king, and the female from the opposing area will be an equal queen to reign a lot. That's very critical. So in this time in the Biru, men and women were equal, and the king and queen were, so, were seen to be equal in uh, power. So they chose by lot, and if, a lot, if by lot a south male was chosen, then they chose a north male, a female, to be his spouse. So what they did was they started to have political alliances, much like we see in our political structure, especially in and, um, antiquity, where a king would marry a queen from another land, and that would create an alliance, and then their children would be... Um, okay, go ahead, do this. Okay. So what happened next is Nibiru started losing its atmosphere. They were getting radiated. They were uh, in danger of dying from no atmosphere. And so they, the council said, look, why don't we uh, try bombing the volcanoes? Maybe we can make a, a, a dust cloud that will cover um, the whole planet and keep our atmosphere in. So they, they took their nukes that they'd been using for wars, and they, they dropped them down the volcanoes and made a lot of dust, but it still didn't really solve the problem. The other thing was they knew that they could make white powder of monoatomic gold, which would float up and could really provide a good shield. And uh, their instruments had shown that the asteroid belt 
and uh, Earth had a lot of gold, and uh, their uh, astronomers had said that Earth itself was formed when a moon of Nibiru, and then Nibiru itself had struck what's now the Pacific Basin and exposed all the uh, gold. What, yes, Janet, wants to talk? Well, I'm sorry for the interruption. I, I had to take care of uh, incoming coal. So, sorry, we're new to this. We have to somehow block the incoming calls. But the critical thing after this union of, a, of a, the North and the South is they said, let their firstborn son be the successor. So they still have kind of a patriarchy thing where the son is the successor. And so this starts a system that is going to this day about men being um, somewhat more valuable than women. The firstborn son, and also this thing about the firstborn. And this is, pay attention, this comes into play. It, it, it comes into play later. Later. So let a unified dynasty thus be formed, unity on Nibiru forever to be established. Now we'll go back to reading some more, and then we'll do a discussion. Well, let me just say that what they established was a military dictatorship. There were two royal princes, commanders of the weapons, that protected the palace with these uh, divine weapons called the Royal Hunter and the Royal Smiter. And the uh, palace uh, was flanked by these uh, uniformed astronauts, and they had a winged uh, emblem of Nibiru on their uniforms. And uh, the, uh, the king sat on the throne room, and his foremost son, which is a son by his half-sister, even though it wasn't the, uh, necessarily the firstborn son, uh, uh, sat on his other side. Okay, so what's happening now is uh, these people are getting desperate about what to do uh, about uh, this change in the weather. And so if you would start reading here, Janet, this is the part I want you to do next. Start there. Okay, from circuit to circuit, nearing the sun, heat grew stronger. In the faraway abode, coldness was more biting. In Agade, the throne city, the king, those of great understanding, assembled. Volcanoes, the atmosphere's forebears, less belching, were spitting up. Nibiru's air has thinner been made. The protective shield has been diminished. From circuit to circuit, Nibiru's atmosphere, more breaching, suffered. With missiles, the volcanoes to attack, their dormancy to bestir, bestir their belching to increase. The atmosphere to replenish, the breach to make disappear. For decision, Lama was too feeble. What choice to make, he knew not. Okay, so now we come to this. An upstart prince named Alalu pushed Lamu off of a tower and said, I, I'm doing something about it. I'm not going to let us all die here. I'm king now. Well, up stepped the guy that would have been king next after Lamu, someone named Anu, and said, hey, I'm supposed to be king. And uh, Alalu said, now wait, I'll make a deal with you. Marry, have your son, Enki, the, the, he was a great scientist, he said to this Prince Anu, who, who said he's the real successor to should be the next king, he said, your son Enki, Anu, can uh, marry my daughter Damkina, and their kid will then uh, be the next king after me. Would you agree to that? That's way better than us having a war and having to fight in another civil war. And Anu said, okay, I'll go for it. And so Enki did, uh, and, and they made Enki break his engagement to whoever he was engaged with, a, a very important person named Nimma. But we'll come back to that. So Enki married Damkina, and they had a son named Marduk, who was for a while regarded as the heir apparent to Alalu. But then Anu revolted. Anu said, you're not doing it. Where uh, uh, Things aren't getting better. The probes you sent out toward Earth got hit by uh, uh, asteroids. We lost 500 astronauts. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Alalu, I'm challenging you. And so they, when we challenged him, he's wrestling. He's let's wrestle. He's said, two great big, you know, 12-foot guys. Let's wrestle, and whoever wins will be the uh, uh, be king, and that's a hell of a lot better than, than having another war. So they fought, and Anu won. And uh, then he was afraid he was going to get executed. So Alalu ran to where the uh, rockets with the missiles were, and he grabbed one, and he blasted to Earth. And when he got the asteroid belt, and instead of trying to dodge the shifting around asteroids, he used some nukes and blasted him out of the way. And he landed at Basara, at the head of the Persian Gulf, and waded ashore and found there was uh, decent uh, air there. He took off his helmet. Uh, it was, he was just totally uh, he, uh, happy. He aimed his missiles at Nibiru and... Uh, Set, and he took samples from the Persian Gulf, and he said, there's gold here, I can save the planet, and if you don't capitulate and make me king of Nibiru and Earth as well, I'm going to blast Nibiru uh, from, with my nukes. And so Anu back on, on, got the message and, and, and uh, said to his, son, to his son, Enki, look, he's your father-in-law. Can you, I mean, if I send you, maybe you can calm him down and, and, and get these, so the missiles aren't pointing at us. So Enki came to Earth. I'm going to give this to Janet a little bit now. 
All right. So we see that they uh, had developed a system of resolving conflict by wrestling, and this comes into play later. And it's very interesting to see a civilization that was once warring, blasting each other to nuclear holocaust, picking a champion to wrestle and solve issues. So that was quite essential. Can you give me the book, honey, that you put over there? I want to read some more of our ongoing. Can you close the book? So can you open it to where we are, please? Thank you. Hold on one second. I'll probably get back on track. <laughs> the next thing is the... Uh, I want to read a little bit of how it is actually without fast-forwarding, because they, I went on this just to get a, a feel for the poetry. Okay. And it, we just get little bits and pieces here and there. Oh, they're missing. The, the beautiful poetry. Okay, start, start with... Uh, Start with uh, this, where, where Anu steps forth and is contesting the kingship with Olalu, if you wish. Okay. The part that's underlined. From among the princes, a young prince stepped forward about the kingship words he wished to say. Succession must be reconsidered to the assembly, he said. Then neither firstborn nor by the queen a son of pure seed am I descended. The essence of An in me is preserved by no concubine diluted. An was the, the founder of the whole dynasty. And this is Anu his son. The counselors heard the words with amazement. The young prince to step closer they summoned. They asked for his name. It is Anu. After my forefather An am I named. They inquired about his generations. Of An's three sons he then reminded. Anki was the firstborn. Without son or daughter he died. Anib was the middle son. Instead of Anki the throne he ascended. Anib, the daughter of his youngest brother, took to be wife. From them onward the succession is in the annals, annals recorded. Who was that younger brother, a son of An and Antu, one of purest seed? The counselors with wonderment looked at each other. Enuru was his name, Anu to them announced. He was my great ancestor. His spouse, Nin Yuru, was a half-sister. Her son was firstborn, and Amma was his name. His wife was a half-sister. By laws of seed and succession, succession, a son, she bore him. A pure descent, the generations continued. By law and by seed, perfect. So this is the Im Im important part, if you want. So they were very concerned with um, genetics and who would be the rightful heir to the throne. And you'll see that the racism that still uh, abounds in this planet actually comes back to this idea of royalty and that some people are better than others. And it's, it was already built into these guys' society way before they created the hybrids that they are. Okay, so here's uh, the counselors uh, are looking at, uh, at Anu's credentials and they're saying, let Anu be king, many counselors shouted, let Alalu be removed. To Prince Anu, Alalu his arm and embrace offered to Anu, he thus said, Though by different offsprings, one ancestor, are we both descended. Let us live in peace together. Nibiru to abundance return. Let me keep the throne. Let you keep the succession. To the council words he directed. Let Anu crown prince be. Let him be my successor. Let his son, my daughter, espouse. Let succession be united. Anu bowed before the council to the assembly. He thus declared, Allah is cupbearer. I shall be his successor in waiting, a son of mine, a daughter of his, as bride shall choose. In this manner, Alalu on the throne remained. Let the celestial boats be constructed, he decided, to seek gold in the hammered belt, he decided. Do you want to read on? Yeah. No, I thought we could discuss that a little bit before we go on, sure. because this is very important. Yes. So they're very concerned about their offspring, so they made a, a, an agreement that Anu would uh, remain on the throne. Is that no, Anu's that Alalu, oh, that's right. Alalu would, re would remain on the throne, and Anu's son, who is Enki, would marry Alalu's daughter. Damkina. Damkina. And their, their son, would, who was yet to be conceived, and is Marduk, and he would become heir king, apparent. the heir apparent, the king of Nibiru right. in due time. Now, what we know is that Anu is still alive, and Alalu is dead. We'll explain all this later. So I'm not sure how that works. Is Does Anu have to step aside for Marduk to roll the Giru, or do they have to wait for his death? And his death could be millions of years because the uh, Anunnaki are very long lived. We'll, we'll see that uh, okay, Marduk and, and Anu have different ideas about, about so this. The, so, so the last thing uh, on this page of uh, the first tablet of the Lost Book of Enki was they were talking about let the celestial boats be constructed to seek gold in the hammered bracelet. So they are in um, Nibiru, which is way out beyond the orbit of where Earth is, and they have to come through the hammer belt, and that is our um, asteroid belt yes. that is between Mars and the Earth. So they're talking about the hammered bracelets, 
and the previous uh, trip in, the boats were crushed, and none of them returned. Yeah, but I want you, if you want to read on, you should read this double part. Just let me do it. So, All right, so yeah. we'll, we'll let for you nine, go read again. Okay. And then we'll so for nine counted periods, that's orbits uh, of Nibiru around uh, Nemesis, Alalu was king on Nibiru. In the ninth orbit, Anu gave battle to Alalu. They grappled with each other. We should read this, this whole thing because it's really powerful. Yeah, we for nine counted periods, Alalu was king on Nibiru, and in, in the ninth char, Anu gave battle to Alalu to hand-to-hand -hand combat with bodies naked. Alalu, he challenged, let the winner be king, Anu said. They grappled with each other in the public square. Doorposts trembled and walls shook. Alalu bent his knee to the ground. He fell on his chest. Alalu in combat was defeated by acclaim. Anu was hailed as king. Anu to the palace was escorted. Alalu to the palace did not return. For the from the clouds, Alalu stealthily escaped. Of dying like Lama, he was fearful. Unbeknownst to others, the place of the celestial par chariots, rockets, he, hurried, he hurriedly went into a missile-throwing chariot. Alalu climbed. Its hatch behind him he closed. And then it goes on. Unbeknownst to others, in the celestial boat, Alalu from Nibiru escaped. To snow you to earth, Alalu set his course. By a secret, from the beginning, he chose his destination. Yeah, so uh, anyway, this is how the Anunnaki first came to the Earth. And there's some critical things that are about to unfold here. But you have to realize the Alalu reigned for nine shars, and shars are three approximately 3,600 years. Right, so you just know 36. <laughs> right. So approximately 36,000 years. So the whole idea in one a rotation of Nibiru, one, and that's what a year is, how long it takes a, a planet to go around its star. So one rotation of Nibiru, 3,600 years, is how long it would take to have 180 generations of us uh, humans who live less than a century uh, born and die. 180. And so you can see these people were very, very long-lived even then. They lived millions of years, but you know, since then, they've had a whole year to work on it. And so they've, got, <laughs> they've gotten even better at it. So uh, Alali was afraid that he would be killed. So apparently this, he killed the other guy. this battle to, for gaining the throne <clears throat> could have ended with him being assassinated or something. Yeah, Lama's well, uh, uh, kids and everybody said, this, this bastard murdered our dad. He pushed him off of the, of a, uh, you know, off the tower. You know, so there were these factions. And so we had this faction already beginning. You'll see, there's the Alalu, Alalu faction, and uh, it, it gets even worse. But right now it's Anu versus Alalu, and Anu is sending his uh, son, the scientist. He was called Ia then, uh, but he became Enki anyway. He was sending his son. Listen, you go talk to your father-in-law and get him to take down those missiles so they ain't pointing at us. And let's see if we can work something out. You're the only one that you're, because you know, you're, you're, you both sides will listen to you. And so now, uh, but you just, so one of Alalu's uh, kinsmen is the interplanetary pilot that's now driving the rocket ship. So let me, that let me, Enki's on. Let me read this here because this is a very important piece. <clears throat> I'm announced to others to the, pal to the place of the celestial chariots he heard me went into a missile throwing chariot allowed him to climb its hatch behind him he closed the four part four part chamber four part chamber he entered and he went to the commander's seat he occupied that which shows the way he lit up with bluish aura the chamber firing so that which shows the way probably is a, a Google screen, map. like a Google map it's a um, and the fire stones he stirred up their hum like music was enthralling so they had some kind of Fire system, reactors, probably, um, yeah, there was something that was powering it. They're talking about their yeah. power system. And so unbeknownst to others in the celestial boat from Alalu, about Alalu from Nibiru escaped to snow hewed earth, Alalu set his course. So he, they, they knew about earth, and he set his course. He knew this course. He had his own Google Earth, Google, Google solar system, and he fired his chariot. All right. So let's go to another part and read a little bit. Well, before we, before we read, let me just, just say that in, in, in ordinary English uh, just what, what's happening here. The uh, pilot is a guy named Anzu, who is, uh, he's an astronomer, he's a pilot, and he's an ally of Alalu, and, and he's driving this thing, uh, uh, so he's acceptable to Alalu, who's got the missiles aimed at Nibiru. So when Anki gets to near the asteroid belt, uh, Anzu says, 
uh, let's let's you know, let's you know blast. We've got some uh, nukes here. Let's blast these uh, asteroids out of the way. And Anki said, "No way! It's against the laws of planetary colonization. He cites these laws to use uh, nukes in space this way. Let's just use the water cannon and get these, uh, and we'll just do that." And so um, they're using the water cannon, and Anzu is getting panicked. You're, you're knocking on. Hey, the, the, we're heating up. We need the water. We can't keep diverting it to knocking these rocks out of our way. And so what they, they just when things are getting too hot. They land their rocket ship on Mars. There's a lake there. This is like 450,000 years ago. Understand? 450,000 years ago. Okay, so now they're landing. There's a, there's a lake there. They get water. They actually are able to take off their, uh, their helmets a little bit. It's not as good as atmosphere as they, as they like, but it, it works. There's an atmosphere and there's water, and they cool everything off, and then they proceed uh, to Earth. I'm going to give this back to Janet now. I'll find a place for her to read Okay, so he's spinning the book for me to continue, looking for the next part. And so we're, we realize that they're arriving here on Earth, and there's going to be a lot of things unfolding that are totally relevant to humanity and how we got to get here. Because Earth at this time was evolving on its own, and there was life here, abundant life here. And we had Homo erectus and Neanderthalitis. No, no, Neanderthal came later. Neanderthal was. We'll, we'll talk oh, about that. Here. Tell us what was at that time. Okay, there had been there had been a, there had been the survivors of a number of extinction events. Earth had been settled. Uh, Michael Cremo's work has showed these large skeletons of people who had pottery and uh, baskets and, and, and technology. You know, full-on human beings of various kinds. And there was lots of these human groups in different parts of the earth. But the one that was uh, uh, we'll be dealing with a lot is one called Homo erectus and. Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll talk about Neanderthal and a little bit later, but right now it was it was uh, uh, we're, we're jumping ahead. When they first landed on Earth, uh, there's there, where they landed in the Persian Gulf. I mean, it was really nice and lush there. It wasn't all desert like it is, is now or anything like that. But it, in the Basara area, and they found there's uh, they took samples and uh, there was a gold flecks in the water, but it wasn't. They sent it back to Nibiru and it didn't have all that much gold and it. it. Was so, so much trouble to get. So Anki chased uh, this. Uh, Gold, and he found there was lots of it was coming from Africa. But in the meantime, uh, Enki fired Anzu. He, he didn't trust Anzu anymore, and he went to where uh, Alalu's uh, rockets was, and he took the missiles out and he hid them. He flew them with his pilot, uh, a, a guy named Abgal, down to a Zimbabwe area and hid them in a cave. Okay, so he hid the missiles. And Anzu uh, didn't know it was gone. And when Anzu found out that the missiles were taken out of Alalu's ship, he started flipping out, and Enki fired him. You're, you're, you're fired, Anzu. Uh, and so, meanwhile, back in Nibiru, well, maybe I should just stop here. Janet probably wants to read some of this. Yeah, I wanted to go back in time to their landing here. Okay, good. You go way down yeah, the yeah. line, and I, don't, I want to slow this down, okay. this process down. So I need a second to find where... You know, it was very important their landing. Yeah, I had it. And, um, and we don't even have it yeah, here yet. And he's not here yet. Yeah, I know. You turned away from it. Okay, so. so let me show you again. Yes. Could you please find it and slow down a little bit about where we're at? Let's do, let's do the time frame. I, I know. Why you okay. He's talking about Anzu. And this is where you start. You just read the part that's underlined and it'll, it'll flow. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Now, this is the account of how the olden times began, and of the era that in the annals, the golden era, by name was known, and how from the Nibiru to earth the missions went, the gold to obtain. The escape of Alalu from the Nibiru was its beginning. With great understanding was Alalu endowed much knowledge he, by learning acquired, by his forefather, Anshagal, of the heavens and the circuits, much knowledge was amassed. By Anshar was knowledge greatly augmented. Of that, Alalu made great much learning with the state... Sorry, with that, Alalu made much learning with the sages he discoursed, savants and commanders he consulted. Thus was knowledge at the beginning ascertained. Thus did Alalu this process of knowledge gain. The gold in the hammered bracelet was a confirmation. The gold in the hammered bracelet of gold in Tiamat's upper half was the indication. That's the astronaut belt. So what they were, they had known that there was gold in the asteroid belt, and they were going to use gold to build a shield around their planet, which was losing its atmosphere, much like we have holes in our ozone. The planet Nibiru, after all these years of war and, and death and destruction, they had practically annihilated themselves, and they had destroyed their planet's ability to sustain its own atmosphere. Does this sound familiar? So what was critical for both them and for us, human beings, because we would not be here if not for the Anunnaki, was that they figured out how to save their home world, and in doing that, we will find out that's how we came to be. So they had a theory, which was known in antiquity, that there was gold in the hammered belt. And that's why Alali was coming to the earth, because he thought that there was gold in the earth. And the reason being is that the hammered belt was the result of a collision that was 
that happened billions of years ago, and it was in the Pacific Basin. One of the passings of Nibiru, um, one of the moons of Nibiru, hit the Earth, and uh, the Earth was known as Tiamat in those days, and pushed um, the, uh, the asteroid belt out. Well, I don't know exactly how it landed up, but right now in time, the asteroid belt is part of the Earth. Okay, go ahead and fill that in, please. Well, well originally, Proto-Earth, or Tiamat, was located between Mars and Jupiter, and when uh, first the moon of Nibiru, called the Ill Wind, and uh, also T uh, Nibiru itself struck what's now the Pacific Basin, it knocked Tiamat, uh, the was half of it that was left, into orbit between uh, Venus and Mars, where we are now, and it knocked the part that was uh, where the Pacific hole was, in, to become the belt of asteroids. Well, uh, that's, uh, and, the mantle, how thick the Earth is underneath the Pacific Basin, is only 12 miles deep, and it's all from sediment running off from the land and from volcanoes, whereas the rest of the Earth is like 65 miles deep. So the, uh, the geological evidence certainly supports this uh, view that the uh, Nibirans had uh, of Earth. It's, they, knocked, they knocked all the uh, continents to one, one the other side of the planet. And so uh, they followed, uh, Enki and Alalu uh, followed the track of where the gold flecks we're going because it, was, it wasn't enough, and they found huge, huge deposits of gold. It's still the richest gold mines in the world in the south of Africa. And uh, so Enki started. He had his astronauts, about 200 of them, uh, digging for this stuff. Anyway, here's Janet again. All right. <clears throat> At the planet of gold, Halali victoriously arrived, his chariot with the thunder crashing. With a beam, he scanned the place his whereabouts to discover. His chariot on dry land descended at the edge of extended marshes it landed. He put on an eagle's helmet. He put it on a fish's suit. The chariot's hatch he opened. At the open hatch he stopped to wonder. Dark hued was the ground, blue-white blue were the skies. No sound there was. There was no one to bid him welcome. Alone on an alien planet he stood, perchance from Nibiru, forever exiled. To the ground himself he lowered. On the dark-hued soil he stepped. There were hills in the distance. Nearby much vegetation there was. Ahead of him there were marshes. Into the marsh he stepped. By the water's coolness he shuddered. Back to the dry ground he stepped. Alone on an alien planet he stood. The thoughts he was possessed of spouse and offspring with longing he remembered. Was he forever from Nibiru exiled? But that again and again he wondered. To the chariot he soon returned with food and drink to be sustained. Then deep sleep him overcame a powerful slumber. How long he slept he could not remember. What awakened him he could not tell. A brightness he was outside, a brilliance on Nibiru, unseen. A, the pull, a pull from the chariot he extended with a tester it was equipped. It breathed the planet's air, compatibility it indicated. The chariot's hatch he opened, and at the open hatch he took a breath. Another breath he took, then another and another. The air of key indeed compatible was. Alalu clapped his hand, the song of joy he was singing. Without an eagle's helmet, without a fish's suit, to the ground himself he lowered. The brightness outside was blinding. The rays of the sun were overpowering. Into the chariot he returned, a mask for the eyes he donned. So I'm going to stop up there. So what he was discovering, Sunglasses. he was discovering that, um, first of all, he, that he thought he was going to be alone and forever exiled from Nibiru. And at this point in the story, <clears throat> it, you know, it was true. He never did. He never did to get back to the bureau, so it's very sad for him to contemplate. Well, we'll see why he didn't get yeah, we'll, back. We'll, we'll explore that. But this is, uh, they didn't know that they could breathe the atmosphere, they had to test it. This is what we would have to do if we are going to another planet. And when he, when he stepped into the water, it was so cold, it even penetrated the suit. He had to go back inside. But they had frogmen out there, so we see statues <laughs> of, of, of what we would clearly say, this is a, a scuba gear. Right, so he put on a scuba gear because he... Um, his fish's suit, they call it. fish's suit, right. So it's very interesting to, to read this, and this is written um, a of a time that's 450,000 years yeah. ago. So then it, it pursues, and he finds that the, the water were filled. You know, he had no food, no water, so the waters with fishes were filled. And all the drinking water was not fit, so he's greatly disappointed. And so he looked at the hills, and he started to go that direction. And he went through the vegetation, and bushes to trees gave way. And then he found a place which was like an orchard. The trees with fruits with, were laden. And by the sweet smell, he was enticed. And Alalu picked a fruit in his mouth, he put it, and, this, and this, the smell was sweet, but sweeter the taste was. So this is how he discovered food here on Earth. So Earth, we already had fruit-bearing trees and orchards. Yeah, the, the seeds, uh, the, the waters of Nibiru and the seeds of Nibiru and that of Tiamat mixed during the collision so that the same DNA, the basic DNA, was the same on both planets. So, of course, the food 
and the like was compatible. So he probably had landed originally in salt water, so he starts, he's looking for right. fresh water. So he keeps proceeding and eventually gets um, among the tree the wetness in his feet. He senses a sign of close by waters. So in the midst of the forest, there was a pond, and he lowered the sampler into the water for drinking. He was looking for drinking water, and it was good. So Alalu laughs, an unstoppable laughter. See, it's magic. He's like, he's always thousands of miles from home, never to see the good again, and, and um, he's alone. He's, Robinson, he's the original Robinson Crusoe, and, and his island is Earth, his island Earth. And so he laughs because, ah, there's drink of water. He's going to live. He's not going to die that way. And the air was good. The water for drinking was fit, and there were fruit and fishes. What more could you ask for? He had landed in, in a paradise, Earth paradise. So what would you like to say? Oh, I'll read a bit if you if you. Uh, yeah. okay. Okay, so the air was good, the water for drinking was fit, there was fruit, there were fishes. But a slithering body by the poolside moved. He has carried weapons, he seized a blast of its ray toward the hissing he directed, and the slithering body lay still. Dead was the creature, its long body was. Without hands or feet was the body. It was, of course, a snake. Okay, and so it goes on. They were, they, he found the gold. Nibiru's fate, he wires back to the speaker of words. That's their communication device. He stirs it up. Nibiru's fate in my hands. On another world... I am the gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is in my hands. To my conditions, you must give heed. I think that's probably it for the day. We, well, really we, covered a lot we have five minutes left, so let's just wrap this up and um, discuss what we covered so far. So this, this book goes on from 450,000 years ago, and it ends around 2150 B.C. So we're going to be 20, covering 2025 yeah. B.C. Well, I'm going to bring it with us. Seek. Dr. Sasha Lesson, and with me right now is... Janet Kerr Lesson. Yeah. This is some really, really interesting uh, stuff from ancient anthropology. Now that we know what we know about genetics, and we've been able to translate ancient writings uh, from Sumer, from way long ago, from uh, after 11,000 years ago even, and uh, this will absolutely change everything once we realize that these two great scientists... Zachariah Sitchin and uh, Michael Tellinger have put together the mysteries of how we got to be how we are and why we keep fighting each other and why we have diseases and stuff like that. And with this knowledge, we are going to be able to take care of things in a way better way than ever before. And so what this uh, um, whole branch of study is called revisionist anthropology, where we look at the so-called uh, myths of ancient civilizations, and instead of saying, well, yeah, these guys were smart, they built great big buildings and uh, had all this, uh, it could make bricks and do all kinds of great things like that, uh, but they just made up these stories about gods who told them how to do everything. They, they have primitive minds when it comes to gods. Well, what we, have, what we can now tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that these so-called gods were just big, tall people, I mean, 12 to 15 foot people, and they're depicted in, in all, on statues and drawings and everything, it's just exactly that, who have laser weapons, who have rocket ships, who have helicopters, and who controlled uh, the planet through a hybrid uh, race of slaves, that's us, that they manufactured. What I would like to do uh, right now is to just look at uh, the main things that they said, sort of an overview of um, uh, what they gave us and how they conditioned us to be in what's essentially the same matrix that they created right now, one of hierarchy, of uh, competition, of war, you know, the, the, uh, uh, that kind of uh, thing, a, a uh, degradation and derogation of women and minorities and a, a very small ruling elite and the whole thing which we got from them. And so we will go back to what they had on, on their planet before they got here and uh, what they created here and what we can do to get out of it. Um, would you like to say anything to sort of uh, kick off the thing, Janet? Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to listen to our first broadcast of Enki Speaks. Our website is EnkiSpeaks.com, www.Enki, which is spelled E-N-K-I, and Speaks, S-P-E-A-K-S.com. And uh, we're going to explore the writings of um, the ancient astronauts and what they left behind here on the Earth, 
the anomalies all over the planet and their current interactions with humanity and the messages they left us. And so we're starting by exploring, what is the book, first book we're starting with? Uh, oh. Go ahead. Basically, the thing of the book that brings a lot of this together is called The Lost Book of Enki, where the Atayas and the Enuma Elish uh, are all brought together in a cogent whole, basically from the writings that were dictated by one of the, the chief scientists of the gold mining expedition to Earth, whose name was Enki. But I, I, just, I, should give, I would like to sort of give an overview of what we'll be getting into slowly in, 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 in detail. I was, attracted, yeah, I was attracted to all this stuff because... Um, there were so many uh, unaccountable things in, in, in our history. Suddenly there were these jumps in civilization, and there was a uh, movement of gigantic uh, stones that we can't even move today, uh, all kinds of amazing stuff that uh, no one in the 1900s uh, kind of uh, anthropologist could make any sense of, but now we can make lots of sense of all this stuff. Okay, so we have this history that uh, these people of ancient Sumer wrote uh, with, on clay tablets, and we can now read what they wrote, uh, and they said, that here's what the gods dictated, and, uh, and, and this story in a nutshell, we're going to look at this in great detail because it's very, very important to us, is that uh, their planet, which was revolving around a, a dwarf, a, a dark star dwarf named Nemesis, intersected our uh, inner solar system, and they were coming here to get gold because they were losing their atmosphere, and it was determined that if there was gold here, and we're going to really go into how they, all that came about. And they wanted to bring the gold back and refine it down to the white powder of monoatomic gold and put that, let that float all over their atmosphere and hold the atmosphere in. That's why they came here. And uh, they, uh, so the astronauts were digging in the African gold mines, and they revolted. And their chief scientist said, look, uh, I'll uh, graft some of our genes onto these local humans here, humans called Homo erectus, and we'll make these short-term slaves that'll be happy to work for us and, and they can do the mining. And then as the mining operations grew and, and the uh, expedition leaders settled down to have uh, thieves of their own, basically they used them for farming and then they started warring against each other and used them as uh, military. And when the humans started to realize there's only a few thousand of these um, and there's millions of uh, these hybrids, that's us, uh, they started uh, becoming alarmed. And, yeah, yeah. And so uh, what happened was they realized that in one of the passes of uh, their planet, as it was going to come uh, between Mars and Jupiter, it was going to make the ice on the Antarctic slide into the South Sea and cause a great big deluge and just really t totally mess up the Earth. And so um, the commanders said, don't, said to all of the Nibirans, don't tell the hybrids, that's us, they're, they're an illegal race anyway, we're not, we're not supposed to create slave races according to the uh, laws of planetary colonization, so just let them all drown, and I forbid anyone to tell them. Well, the chief scientist, one of the guys that made the hybrids, uh, instead of telling them, he took the, the plans, the computer plans, and put it in Noah's wall. We, Noah's real name was the Asutra in the Sumerian stuff. Uh, how to make a submersible, and, and this guy, Enki, left his son. Aloha. This is Dr. Sasha Lesson, and with me right now is... Janet Care Lesson. Yeah. This is some really, really interesting uh, stuff from ancient anthropology. Now that we know what we know about genetics and we've been able to translate ancient writings uh, from Sumer from way long ago, from uh, after 11,000 years ago even, and uh, this will absolutely change everything once we realize that these two great scientists, Zachariah Sitchin and uh, Michael Tellinger, have put together the mysteries of how we got to be how we are and why we keep fighting each other and why we have diseases and stuff like that. And with this knowledge, we are going to be able to take care of things in a way better way than ever before. And so what this uh, um, whole branch of study is called revisionist anthropology, where we look at the so-called uh, myths of ancient civilizations. And instead of saying, well, yeah, these guys were smart. They built great big buildings and uh, had all this. Uh, it could make bricks and do all kinds of great things like that. Uh, but they just made up these stories about gods who told them how to do everything. They, they have primitive minds when it comes to gods. Well, what we, have, what we can now tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that these so-called gods were just big, tall people. I mean, 12 to 15 foot people. And they're depicted in, in all, on statues and drawings and everything, it's just exactly that, who have laser weapons, who have rocket ships, who have helicopters, and who controlled uh, the planet through 
a hybrid uh, race of slaves, that's us, that they manufactured. What I would like to do uh, right now is to just look at uh, the main things that they said, sort of an overview of um, uh, what they gave us and how they conditioned us to be in what's essentially the same matrix that they created right now, one of hierarchy, of uh, competition, of war, you know, the, the, uh, uh, that kind of uh, thing, that deriga uh, degradation and derogation of women and minorities and a, a very small ruling elite and the whole thing, which we got from them. And so we will go back to what they had on, on their planet before they got here and uh, what they created here and what we could do to get out of it. Um, would you like to say anything to sort of uh, kick off the thing, Janet? Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to listen to our first broadcast of Enki Speaks. Our website is EnkiSpeaks.com, www.Enki, which is spelled E-N-K-I, and Speaks, S-P-E-A-K-S, dot com. And uh, we're going to explore the writings of um, the ancient astronauts and what they left behind here on the Earth, the anomalies all over the planet, and their current interactions with humanity, and the messages they left us. And so we're starting by exploring, what is the book, first book we're starting with? Uh, well, go ahead. Basically, <clears throat> the thing, the book that brings a lot of this together is called The Lost Book of Enki, where the Atra uh, Tayas and the Enuma Elish uh, are all brought together in a cogent whole, basically from the writings that were dictated by one of the, the chief scientists of the gold mining expedition to Earth, whose name was Enki. But I, I, just, I, should give, I would like to just sort of give an overview of what we'll be getting into slowly and in and, and, and detail. I was, attracted, yeah, I was attracted to all this stuff because um, there were so many uh, unaccountable things in, in, in our history. Suddenly there was these jumps in civilization and there was a uh, movement of gigantic uh, stones that we can't even move today, uh, all kinds of amazing stuff that uh, no one in the 1900s uh, kind of uh, anthropologist could make any sense of, but now we can make lots of sense of all this stuff. Okay, so. We have this history that uh, the people of ancient Sumer wrote uh, with, on clay tablets, and we can now read what they wrote. Uh, and they said, here's what the gods dictated. And, uh, and, and the story, in a nutshell, we're going to look at this in great detail because it's very, very important to us, is that uh, their planet, which was revolving around a, a dwarf, a, a dark star dwarf named Nemesis, intersected our uh, inner solar system. And uh, they were coming here to get gold because they were losing their atmosphere and it was determined that if there was gold here and we're going to really go into how they all that came about and they wanted to bring the gold back and refine it down to the white powder of monoatomic gold and put that let that float all over their atmosphere and hold the atmosphere in that's why they came here and uh, they uh, so the astronauts were digging in the african gold mines and they revolted and their chief scientist said look uh, I'll uh, graft some of our genes onto these local humans here, humans called Homo erectus, and we'll make these short-term slaves that'll be happy to work for us and, and they can do the mining. And then as the mining operations grew and, and the uh, expedition leaders settled down to have uh, thieves of their own, basically they used them for farming and then they started warring against each other and used them as uh, military. And when the humans started to realize there's only a few thousand of these um, and there's millions of uh, these hybrids, that's us, uh, they started uh, becoming alarmed and, and yeah yeah and so uh, what happened was they realized that in one of the passes of uh, their planet as it was going to come uh, between mars and jupiter it was going to make the ice on the antarctic slide into the south sea and cause a great big deluge and just really t totally uh, mess up the earth and so um, the commander said don't he said to all of the nibirans don't tell the hybrids that's us they're, they're an illegal race anyway we're not, we're not supposed to create slave races according to the uh, laws of planetary colonization, so just let them all drown, and I forbid anyone to tell them. Well, the chief scientist, one of the guys that made the hybrids, uh, instead of telling them, he took the, the plans, the computer plans, and put it in Noah's wall. Noah's real name was the Asutra in the Sumerian stuff. Uh, how to make a submersible, and, and this guy, Enki, left his son, Nergal, to drive the uh, submersible to the top of Mount Ararat in, in Turkey, and uh, they, uh, the uh, Nibirans decided they would now rule through the descendants of Noah, and uh, it's the descendants of those descendants of those descendants that to this very day rule us and follow the same pattern of divide and conquer and uh, that's the, in a nutshell and what, it, uh, what they did. And they, their competition got so heavy that at one point uh, the commander actually nuked uh, his, his, his nephew's forces, but 
the fallout from the nuking uh, of Sinai and uh, the uh, cities on the south end of the Dead Sea, the fallout from that blew all over Sumer and killed everybody there. The only people to escape were the people that were too far north in Babylon. And so they, the head of the of Niburian in Babylon, a guy named Marduk or Ra, took over for a while. And, and so it is. Most of these guys from Nibiru left uh, from uh, their last base up in Nazca 